Okay, so in chapter 15, we talked about the general sensory receptors. We talked about the sensory pathways that go up to the brain. We talked about a couple of different areas where that's processed in the brain, um, like in the um, um, primary somatosensory cortex. That's going to receive that information. And then you have the homunculus up there. And then we talked a little bit about the, um, how the brain is going to decide what to do about the information it's receiving and it's going to exit the brain through motor pathways, right? And the motor pathways we talked about in chapter 15 were the somatic nervous system pathways going out to skeletal muscles. So we were really talking about that corticospinal pathway. That's the uh, voluntary pathway that starts in that primary um, motor cortex in the postcentral gyrus, okay? So we, we talked about that, but now we have to look at that's not the only motor pathway that there is. You know, those are the motor pathways going to the skeletal muscle, but there's a lot more uh, effectors out in the body. There's the visceral effectors, like smooth muscles, glands, cardiac muscle, adipocytes. Okay, those are the effectors that the central nervous system, or the um, autonomic nervous system is going to send commands to. Okay, so that's what we're going to go over. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to compare those two systems. We want to compare the somatic motor system with the autonomic motor system. All right, so they're both sending out commands. So on this side over here, we have the somatic nervous system. This is somatic. And then on this side, we have the autonomic nervous system. Okay, so we want to talk about both of those. Now, in the somatic nervous system, we already talked about the two neurons that would be used. Um, from that primary motor cortex, we have this upper motor neuron, right? And then that synapse onto, it synapses onto another neuron that we call the lower motor neuron, right? And then that goes out to the skeletal muscles. Right? So that's the somatic nervous system. It's sending motor commands out to skeletal muscles. Those skeletal muscles will then contract. Now, some of them go through cranial nerves. Some, on, some of them go through spinal nerves. Do you remember what the neurotransmitter is that's released at the end of that lower motor neuron? Yep, that's right. So acetylcholine gets released and binds to those receptors on the skeletal muscles, opens up the sodium gates, sodium comes in, we get an action potential, and then we get a contraction, okay? So now we wanna look at what's happening in the autonomic nervous system. The autonomic nervous system is going to start in a different area. It doesn't start in that primary motor cortex because that's voluntary. That's a voluntary, you, you're going to make those muscles um, um, contract voluntarily. Instead, this is going to start in an area lower down in a more subconscious area called the hypothalamus. Right? So that's where the motor commands are going to come from for the autonomic nervous system. All right, so from the hypothalamus, we have a neuron, it's, it's like an upper motor neuron that's um, traveling down the spinal cord or it's gonna exit through a cranial nerve and it synapses onto a neuron that we call the preganglionic neuron. The preganglionic neuron, okay? Then the preganglionic neuron is gonna synapse onto another neuron that's called the ganglionic neuron. Now, sometimes you're gonna hear this ganglionic neuron referred to as the post-ganglionic neuron, okay? Um, or post-ganglionic fibers. When you hear post-ganglionic fibers, it's really just talking about the axon if you talk about the whole neuron, it's, it's the ganglionic neuron. But either way, those two things are kind of synonymous, so don't worry about the difference between the two. 
ganglionic neuron and postganglionic neuron are going to kind of be the same, all right? Um, okay, so what we have to look at then is what are the um, neurotransmitters that are going to be released from in between these their synapses here, right? So we said that in the somatic nervous system, the effectors are skeletal muscles. In the autonomic nervous system, the effectors are going to be glands or um, the heart or smooth muscle or um, adipose tissue. So we're going to be taking a look at the neurotransmitters then that are used at each one of these synapses. So if you look at this, in the autonomic nervous system, we have a synapse here, right here, in between the preganglionic and the postganglionic neuron. And then we have another synapse here between the postganglionic neuron and the, the effectors, right? So this is just kind of giving you a big picture. I'm going to go back and I'm going to kind of go through and break this down so that you can see everything that's going on. But this is, this is um, just showing you a big picture of how the somatic nervous system is different from the autonomic nervous system. So somatic nervous system only has two neurons involved, an upper motor neuron and a lower motor neuron. And the autonomic nervous system is going to have three neurons involved, one in the central nervous system, and then we have our pre- and our postganglionic neurons. Right? So we have more synapses going on in our autonomic nervous system, so we have more neurotransmitters. Right? So we're going to have to look at what those neurotransmitters do. Okay, so now um, within this autonomic nervous system, there are two subdivisions. There's two divisions underneath um, just the heading of autonomic nervous system. I'll just move that over to the side here for a second. Okay. Here's a much better picture. This is the somatic nervous system. This is the, paras this is the autonomic nervous system. And all you're seeing here is that preganglionic neuron and the postganglionic neuron and the different effectors. Showing somatic, we have upper and motor and lower, upper and lower motor neurons. Here is the autonomic nervous system where we have a preganglionic neuron and a postganglionic neuron going out to the effectors. Now, one of the things that I didn't mention in this um, autonomic nervous system is where the preganglionic neuron synapses onto the postganglionic neuron. Wherever we have cell bodies clustered together out in the peripheral nervous system, we call that a ganglion, okay? So that's why we have those terms, preganglionic neuron and postganglionic neuron, because one is before that ganglion, the other one is after that ganglion. So that's just where those two things synapse, right? We have um, both the sympathetic nervous system And we have the parasympathetic nervous system. And we need to look at each one of those very specifically. We talked about those in general a &P. We're going to go back and we're going to go deeper and look at them more in depth. So the sympathetic nervous system is also called the fight or flight. So this is the nervous system that gets stimulated when you are in a crisis situation, if there's a crisis going on. Could be a small crisis, could be a big crisis, but it's, if you think about what would your body do if you saw a bear, or what would your body do if you were under a lot of stress, right? So that's our sympathetic nervous system. Uh, and the parasympathetic nervous system then is called our rest and digest. Okay, so this is where you're relaxing and you're not afraid and you're just trying to let your uh, digestive system work and your urinary system work and um, you're just trying to um, rest and digest. Okay? 
So the sympathetic nervous system can also be called the thoracolumbar. And the reason why we call it thoracolumbar is because that preganglionic neuron exits through T1 to L2. So right in the spinal cord. It's going to exit through spinal nerves, right? T1 through T2 spinal nerves. So we call it thoracolumbar. That's another name you'll hear. Whereas the parasympathetic nervous system, we can call this one the craniosacral. Because these preganglionic neurons are going to exit through cranial nerves and sacral nerves. So we'll be taking a closer look at that. So that's why we call that craniosacral. All right, so in the sympathetic nervous system, some of the effects that we would get if the sympathetic nervous system were to be um, uh, activated, you would have, you know, if you think of what, what your body would be going through if you were under some type of mental stress or physical stress, you would have mental alertness, a heightened mental alertness. You would have an increased metabolic rate. So your metabolic rate increases. What does that mean? That means your cells are breaking down glucose so that they can make energy. So they're, they're using their, their storage, their energy storage, their nutrient storage. They're using it so that they can create more energy, right? Um, you would have... And in, an, in that same sense, you would activate ener energy reserves. So what are your energy reserves? Like glycogen. Break down glycogen into glucose so you can use the glucose to make ATP. Triglycerides. Break down the triglycerides into fatty acids and glycerol so that you can make ATP with that. All right? So we're trying to, we're trying to activate... Um, those energy reserves, break those stored nutrients down. You would also get an increased respiratory rate and heart rate. So increased heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory rate. Think of that's what's going to happen. You know, if you're under a lot of stress, you're going to be, your heart's going to beat faster. You're going to breathe faster, right? Your sweat glands are going to become activated. And they will start secreting sweat. You have increased blood flow to the muscles, skeletal muscles. And to your brain which is why you have your, part of the reason why you're getting um, increased mental alertness. Because your skeletal muscles are contracting and they're, they're getting like tense and ready to go, they're getting facilitated, you will also have increased body temperature because it, every time you're producing ATP for all of these things, for skeletal muscle contraction, for heart rate contraction, for smooth muscle contraction. Every time you make ATP, you also make heat. They're the two energies that are being produced. Okay? And lastly, what's going to happen is you will have a decrease in digestive and urinary function. Okay, digest, uh, decrease in your digestion. You know, you're ready to run away from a bear. You're certainly not going to need to digest your food at that moment. So we want all our energy going to our skeletal muscles and our brain and breaking down nutrients and, you know, whatever we need for that. Parasympathetic nervous system then, this one, on the other hand, is more of a calming effect. The rest, the calm. You're going to decrease metabolic activity. 
So decrease metabolism. Store nutrients. So glucose will be stored as glycogen. Fatty acids and glycerol will be stored as triglycerides. Your heart rate, you're going to have a decrease in heart rate, in blood pressure, in respiratory rate, right? You're resting. You don't need those things to be increased. Your um, passageways, your, your um, airways will constrict. You know, they dilated when you were in the sympathetic nervous system, but they're going to constrict. You don't need, you're resting. You don't need all that air down into your lungs. There's no control over sweat glands here. So no sweat gland control in the parasympathetic. We're going to look into that when we talk about the parasympathetic uh, specifically in the sympathetic nervous system. We'll look at that. Um, so the visceral organs receive blood. So you're going to have increased blood supply. Increased blood flow to the visceral organs. That's to all your digestive, your urinary, all of those um, visceral organs in the abdominal pelvic cavity. Uh, there's no control over um, blood uh, body temperature. So we have no control with the parasympathetic nervous system over sweat glands and um, temp, body temp. Okay, so you're, you're decreasing all of these things. Well, what are you increasing? So in the parasympathetic nervous system, you're going to increase secretions. I mean, and that's the big one, and I probably should have put that way at the top because that's what's really important about the parasympathetic nervous system. Salivary glands start secreting. Lacrimal glands start secreting. Mucous glands start secreting. Um, all the glands, the digestive glands start secreting, right? So there's tons of secretion going on. And so we're going to talk really specifically about the parasympathetic nervous system when we get there. So these are the um, differences, uh, the main differences between the two. And in addition to that, we have to talk about the different neurotransmitters that are going to be used, um, their pathway to get out to the uh, the, the, the peripheral pathway to get out to the effectors. So we're going to talk about some specific things with these things. So we're going to start by looking at the sympathetic division, and we're going to look at um, where those ganglion are. We're going to look at um, the neurotransmitters, uh, a bunch of different specific things with that uh, sympathetic nervous system. So here we go. We're going to start with this. We'll go back to the pictures in just a second. So we said that the sympathetic nervous system is thoracolumbar. So here we can see that the preganglionic neuron is going to exit out through T1 to L2. Then they will synapse in, there's three different um, places where they could, the preganglionic neurons will synapse. One of them is called the sympathetic chain ganglia. The second one is called the collateral ganglia, and the third one is just going right directly to the adrenal medulla, right? So we have to take a look at each one of those. Once they synapse in one of those ganglia, then that postganglionic neuron is going to go to the target organ, and then the target organ is going to respond like you would think it would in the sympathetic nervous system. So when we start getting deep into all of this and start talking about neurotransmitters, I always want you to go back to, okay, what system, what division am I in? Am I in sympathetic? Okay, then this has to be the response, right? So I want you to always go back to that when we start talking about the different types of receptors, okay? All right, so sympathetic nervous system, let's look a little further here. That. So we are not going to spend a ton of time on this, right? But I need to explain to you how that preganglionic neuron and postganglionic neuron synapse into the three different types of, there's two ganglia or it's the um, adrenal medulla. So first of all, um, there is a sympathetic chain ganglia. 
And actually, do I have a better picture of the nervous system here? Where is it? Here we go. All right, so I want to show you this, and then I'm going to go back up to that other picture. So here what we're seeing is the three different type of ganglion, right? If you look at this line here, this line right here, all these little um, bumps that you see there, those are all part of the sympathetic chain. So where you see those ganglia, that means the preganglionic neuron is synapsing right there with that postganglionic neuron, right? And then they're gonna, the postganglionic neuron goes out to all these different organs, right? Then you see these other ones out here, and these are, these out here, these are the collateral ganglia, okay? So we see those as well out here. These are called the collateral ganglia. Right? So there's only three collateral ganglia, right? And we can see that the, um, in that collateral ganglia, the postganglionic neuron are pretty much going to the digestive system on down, right? Those are the effectors from the collateral ganglia. So let's take a look then at what each one of these looks like. And again, I don't want to spend a ton of time on this. So this is a cross-section of our spinal cord. This is the posterior um, median sulcus. This is the anterior median fissure right there. So we know that this right here is the what? Ventral root, right? That's the ventral root. So the... Um, Preganglionic neuron leaves the ventral root, it leaves the spinal cord through the ventral root, and it goes out to one of those ganglia in the sympathetic chain. And then it synapses onto the postganglionic neuron. So if the big point here is if you look at this as, the, um, as that preganglionic neuron is coming out, it's going to go down through that white ramus. So the preganglionic neuron is myelinated, and it goes down through that white ramus. Remember in the spinal cord, we talked about the three divisions of that <coughs> spinal nerve. We had the posterior ramus, the anterior ramus, and the rami communicants, right? So that preganglionic neuron, uh, as, it, as it comes through the ventral root and it exits out of that spinal nerve, it's going to go down through that ventral root. And then it's going to synapse onto the postganglionic neuron. And that postganglionic neuron is going to take a curve backwards. And it's going to go up through that gray ramus. And what did we say about the gray ramus? The gray ramus carries gray versus white unmyelinated neurons, right? So that carries unmyelinated neurons. unmyelinated neurons. And then um, that will then, uh, that postganglionic neuron will then continue out, out to its effectors. So big point, the preganglionic neuron goes through the white ramus, the postganglionic neuron goes through the gray ramus, the preganglionic neuron is myelinated, the postganglionic neuron is unmyelinated. Now when we look at the collateral ganglia, What we see here is that that preganglionic neuron is going to go out from the spinal cord through that ventral root, and it's going to go through that anterior ramus, go through the ganglion without synapsing, and go all the way out to the collateral ganglia. And there's three different collateral ganglia, right? And then that's where it will synapse onto the postganglionic neuron, and the postganglionic neuron will then go out to the effectors. So this right, yep, this right here is the sympathetic chain ganglia, and so the um, collateral ganglia are not going to 
they're not going to even synapse in those ganglia. They're just gonna keep going out to the collateral ganglia. As they exit out of that um, sympathetic ganglia and they don't synapse, we call them splanchnic nerves. Splanchnic, okay? Okay, then finally we get to the suprarenal medulla. The suprarenal medulla is also called the adrenal medulla. That's what we've heard it as. Adrenal medulla, suprarenal, supra means above, renal means the kidney, the adrenal glands sit right above the kidney. So this is the third way um, that an effector can get stimulated by the sympathetic nervous system. And so here we see that preganglionic neuron exit through that ventral root, go all the way through that sympathetic ganglion without synapsing, go all the way through that collateral ganglia without synapsing, and then go directly to the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal medulla is the inside of the adrenal gland, right? And it synapses with the cells inside the adrenal medulla. And the cells inside the adrenal medulla are modified neurons. So the cells inside there are actually the postganglionic neurons right inside that adrenal medulla. The adrenal medulla acts as postganglionic neurons and they will release norepinephrine and epinephrine. So if we want to go back and we want to do a quick oh, this way. And make people dizzy when they watch this. Let's look at each one of these organs. Now, we want to we keep thinking of the sympathetic nervous system as fight or flight. So we're just going to go over all these organs, and we're going to kind of figure out, well, what would happen, and what is it actually synapsing on, right? So what is this synapsing on, and what's going to be the final effect? When we look at the sympathetic nervous system going out to the eye, it's actually going to the eye dilator muscles, right? So when the sympathetic nervous system um, innervates the eye, the dilator muscles, the eye, the pupil will dilate. So it's innervating the pupil dilator muscles and your eyes dilate. When the sympathetic nervous system um, sends a message out to the salivary glands, what do you think it's gonna do there? Is it gonna stimulate those or is it gonna inhibit those? It's going to inhibit because what did we say all the glands were? What, would they, what part of the nervous system division are they from? Parasympathetic, Parasympathetic right? So those are, going to be, those are going to be inhibited. And then at the heart, the sympathetic nervous system would? It's going to increase both heart rate and contractility. So it's going to beat faster and stronger. Okay. Now it's going to get to the lungs. And in the lungs, we're talking about the bronchi and the smooth muscle along out on the outside of the bronchi. So what do you think is going to happen to the smooth muscle in the bronchi? Do you think they're going to constrict or do you think they're going to dilate? They're going to dilate, right? They will dilate because you need more air going into your lungs if you're going to run away from a bear, right? Okay, so now let's look at the digestive, the entire digestive system. What's gonna happen with all of this? Are we going to get an increase or a decrease in all of this function? Decrease. This is gonna be decreased function, all of this, right? Same thing with the um, renal system. Same thing, well, with the, so when we talk about the reproductive system, the sympathetic nervous system causes arousal, right? You get, um, oh, sorry. The parasympathetic system causes arousal. The sympathetic nervous system causes orgasm or emission. The sympathetic nervous system can control each one of these um, organs, each one of these effectors individually, right? So your, your hypothalamus can tell your you know, eye muscles or your pupil muscles to dilate without having any effect on your heart. Or your heart can increase the heart rate without having any effect on your, um, your bronchi dilating. 
So it can have individual effects. And that's usually what happens on a day-to-day -day basis, is that you have individual control over each one of these effectors. But there are times when you enter into a real crisis mode. And when you're in a crisis mode, you enter into what we call sympathetic activation. And in sympathetic activation, it's really the um, everything is going to get activated. Everything. So when we're really talking about a crisis, you know, a um, fight or flight situation, everything gets activated. This, the um, adrenal medulla puts out norepinephrine and epinephrine, and it gets out into the blood. And then the blood will deliver norepinephrine and epinephrine to all of these structures, causing them to respond, right? Causing them to respond. So that's the difference between what sympathetic activation is and just stimulation of the sympathetic nervous system because they can be stimulated individually. All right, so on a day-to-day -day basis, um, you're only using what you need. You're only activating what you need at the time. So, um, all right, so let's take a look at some of the neurotransmitters that the sympathetic division uses. Very well, so one of the pictures that I have isn't in there. So we're, gonna, we're actually going to look at this. This is the sympathetic this is the sympathetic um, nervous system here. It just isn't showing any of the um, organs out here that it stimulates. So, all right. So the sympathetic nervous system is going to use three different uh, neurotransmitters. It uses ACH, it uses norepinephrine, and it uses epinephrine. So when we look at, let's, let's start with ACH first, because ACH is going to be the most simple. Acetylcholine gets released at the ganglia. So we have ACH being released here, 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 and here. It's being released at the ganglia, right? So when we look at this, what, I, what I'm saying here is that Acetylcholine gets released from the preganglionic neuron and it synapses onto the postganglionic neuron and it starts action potentials in the postganglionic neuron. So no matter what, that preganglionic neuron is releasing ACH in all situations. This was at the sympathetic chain. Here is at the collateral ganglia. We still have ACH being released there. Okay. This is um, over here. We have the adrenal medulla. So the adrenal medulla is going to release um, the, the preganglionic uh, neuron releases ACH onto the um, adrenal medulla. And then over on this side, over here, I wanted to explain a couple of exceptions that we have um, that um, I'll talk about more in depth. But at that preganglionic neuron, ACH is going to be released there from that preganglionic neuron. But then at the postganglionic neuron, I'm going to show you some organs where ACH is released from the postganglionic neuron as well. So those are the areas where ACH is going to be released. It's released at the ganglia, and then in certain situations, it'll be released by the postganglionic neuron. Okay, again, ACH is always released at the preganglionic neuron, always. The postganglionic neuron in the sympathetic nervous system is going to release a different neurotransmitter, and that neurotransmitter is called norepinephrine. So whether that um, postganglionic neuron is coming from the sympathetic chain, doesn't matter, it's gonna release norepinephrine. If the postganglionic neuron is coming from the collateral ganglia, doesn't matter, it's gonna release norepinephrine.
if the adrenal, if the um, preganglionic neuron stimulates the adrenal medulla, then the adrenal medulla will release norepinephrine and it'll release epinephrine at the same time. Okay? So those are our neurotransmitters that are being released by those postganglionic neurons. Right now we have an exception. We have a postganglionic neuron in the sympathetic nervous system that releases ACH. It releases ACH at uh, a couple of different effectors. It's going to release ACH at sweat glands. It's going to release um, acetylcholine at um, blood vessels going to skeletal muscles. Nah, blood vessels, yes, going to skeletal muscles. Okay, and the brain. And there's one other, um, one other neurotransmitter that I want to briefly talk about. It's called nitric oxide, or NO, nitric oxide. Some postganglionic neurons are going to release nitric oxide And nitric oxide is going to go to the blood vessels, to the brain, and the skeletal muscles. All right, so both ACH from the postganglionic neuron and nitric oxide from the postganglionic neuron will be able to affect the blood vessels going to the skeletal muscles and to the brain. All right, so let's do a check here. We know that ACH is going to be released by the preganglionic neurons, by all the preganglionic neurons, right? And occasionally it'll be released at the postganglionic neuron when it's going to sweat glands, blood vessels, to the skeletal muscles and brain, right? Whenever ACH is released, we call that a cholinergic synapse. Cholinergic. When norepinephrine and epinephrine, when norepinephrine is released, we call it adrenergic. Adrenergic. So we talk about adrenergic synapses. So where is norepinephrine released? Norepinephrine is released by all of the postganglionic neurons, other than these exceptions right? And it's also released by the adrenal medulla. And the adrenal medulla also releases epinephrine along with norepinephrine. So postganglionic neurons release norepinephrine. The adrenal medulla releases both norepinephrine and epinephrine. Okay, so at the effectors, we have adrenergic synapses at the effectors. At the ganglia, we have cholinergic receptors, or cholinergic synapses. Now we know what happens at the cholinergic synapses. We know that to stop that, acetylcholinesterase breaks down acetylcholine, and then it gets reabsorbed into the synaptic terminal, right? So we know how that stops. Let's look at what happens with the um, adrenergic synapses. So here's our postganglionic neuron. And the postganglionic neuron is making little norepinephrine and putting it into those vesicles. And then when an action potential comes down, Norepinephrine gets released. Norepinephrine is now in the synaptic cleft. It's gonna go over to the effector. And it's going to bind to a receptor at the effector. Norepinephrine is going to have an indirect effect where it uses a second messenger, okay? 
but that's going to open up channels and sodium is going to come in and we're going to end up getting an action potential on the effector. So norepinephrine is going to be um, broken down not by acetylcholinesterase, because that breaks down acetylcholine. Instead, 20% um, of the norepinephrine is going to be broken down by what we call COMPT, <coughs> catechol o methyltransferase. <laughs> okay, so 20% of it is going to be broken down right in that synaptic cleft. Now, the other 80% of norepinephrine will be reabsorbed back into that axon terminal or that synaptic terminal. And in the synaptic terminal, there is another chemical that's called, an, it's called MAO or monoamine oxidase. Now, you might have heard of a, an MAO inhibitor. An MAO inhibitor is not going to break down norepinephrine. It inhibits the breakdown of, it, it inhibits MAO. Have you heard of an MAO inhibitor before? What is an MA, MAO inhibitor? In what text context have you heard of that? It's an antidepressant. That's what it is. It's an antidepressant. Okay. It inhibits MAO. So it's going to inhibit the MAO. So now MAO can't break down norepinephrine. So there's going to be an accumulation of norepinephrine. So you're going to have an, a, an increase in the stimulation of the effectors. So if that were in the brain, that person would then have more stimulation of their brain. They would have more mental alertness. They would have, their, their brain would be um, more stimulated instead of depressed. So 20% is broken down by COMPT. 80% is going to be broken down by MAO. We have to look at um, the receptors. Because even though norepinephrine is being released by the postganglionic neuron, it's not, we can't say, um, it, norepinephrine is going to have different effects on different organs, right? And so we have to look at the receptors. It all depends on the receptors. What receptor is on that effector? Norepinephrine is the only neurotransmitter getting released. So we have to know that the eye dilator muscle will react differently to the heart and the bronchi and all the other organs. So we have to have different receptors that determine what is um, going to be the response by the effector, right? So we have, uh, there's two classes of adrenergic receptors. Remember, adrenergic, again, is norepinephrine. So we have two classes of adrenergic receptors. Okay. We have alpha and we have beta. Alpha and beta. Now norepinephrine is going to stimulate alpha more than beta, but we're not going to worry about that right now. Um, so alpha is mostly just put that in here so we can, it's mostly um, norepinephrine will stimulate it. And then epinephrine will stimulate both. Okay, when you're just trying to affect one, you're trying to stimulate one effector, well, norepinephrine gets released by the postganglionic neurons. But when you're in a crisis and the adrenal medulla is putting out both norepinephrine and epinephrine, then both the alpha and the beta um, receptors will be stimulated. So under alpha, we actually have two different types of alpha receptors that we're going to talk about. And alpha is, you know, that's the symbol for alpha. We have an alpha-1 receptor and we have an alpha-2 um, receptor. We have alpha-1 and alpha-2. Alpha-1 is more common. 
and it is usually excitatory. And by excitatory, if it's a muscle, it's gonna cause contraction. Like a smooth muscle, it'll cause contraction of the smooth muscle. The main places where the alpha receptors are located are going to be on the pupil dilator muscles. and the peripheral blood vessels. So peripheral blood vessels are blood vessels going to your skin, not to the skeletal muscles or the brain, it's going to the skin, peripheral blood vessels. So that's where alpha receptors are found. So when norepinephrine gets released by the postganglionic neuron and it binds to an alpha-1 receptor, we know those alpha-1 receptors are on the pupil dilator muscles and the pupil will dilate. And they're on the peripheral blood vessels and the peripheral blood vessels will contract and they'll constrict. Okay, So that's how in the fight or flight we get pupil dilation and we get blood vessel constriction in the skin. Because when you see someone under extreme amount of stress, right, what happens to their, their complexion? They turn white because those peripheral blood vessels are just constricting and all the blood is going away from the skin. It's trying to get to the skeletal muscles and get to the brain because that's what you need when you're in a crisis, right? Okay, so that's alpha-1. That's where the alpha-1 receptors are found. So the alpha-2 receptors, um, they're going to be found on the preganglionic axon terminals. And so they're going to be um, inhibitory instead of excitatory. Sorry, that is postganglionic. So let me show. Uh, let me show you a picture of it. The alpha two is really confusing, but alpha two is important because of drugs like clonidine, which is a drug that helps to decrease blood pressure. So that's something we need to know. So we kind of want to look at that um, and just make sure that we fully understand what alpha two does, because drugs um, can be uh, an alpha two agonist what can help to, like clonidine, can help to bring down blood pressure. So it's on the postganglionic because it's decreasing norepinephrine release, and norepinephrine gets released from the postganglionic um, axon terminal. So we've got alpha-1 and alpha-2, so um, we'll look at those more closely in just a second. Then we have beta, and there's a beta, this, the symbol looks like this, the alpha that looks like that, the Latin symbol. We have beta-1 and we have beta-2. Beta-1, that receptor is found on the heart. It's also found on the pancreas. It's stimulatory, so when norepinephrine binds to the heart, it's going to um, cause the heart to uh, beat faster but it's inhibitory on the pancreas beta cells and it'll stop the pancreas from secreting insulin. So that part we're gonna put aside for a second, but I just wanna mention it right here and I'll mention it later on. Beta two, these receptors are found on the lungs, right? They're also found on the sphincters of the GI tract, the bladder, and the uterus. So these are the different classes of adrenergic receptors. Now, oh, let's see, let's go down. I tried doing this a little differently today with this app and it's just not going as well as what I wanted to. So I'm gonna just draw a quick picture 
of our, we've got our, um, this is our brain, and then we have our spinal cord here, okay? So you have this picture. Again, we're going back to that same picture. Again, sympathetic nervous system exits the spinal cord between T1 and L2, right? So the preganglionic neuron exits, and what neurotransmitter does it release? Acetylcholine. That binds to the receptor on the postganglionic neuron. The postganglionic neuron is going to go out to the effector, and now it depends on what effector is it when norepinephrine gets released, how is norepinephrine going to, um, how is it going to affect that effector? So if it goes to alpha-1, if, if it binds to an alpha-1 receptor, and where did we say alpha-1 was? Pupil dilator, peripheral blood vessels. Pupil dilator, peripheral blood vessels. That's alpha-1, right? So if a person were given a drug that would stimulate an alpha-1 receptor, what would happen to their pupils? Dilate. What would happen to their peripheral blood vessels? Constrict, right? If their peripheral blood vessels constricted, what would happen to their blood pressure? It would go up, right? Their blood pressure would go up. So alpha-1, pupil dilators, peripheral blood vessels. Um, when we're talking about beta-1, one heart, beta-1. One. Beta-1 one is on the heart. So if you were to give a person a drug that stimulated the beta-1 receptors, what would happen to the heart rate? It would increase. What would happen to the contractility? The strength of contraction would go up, right? Beta-2. Two. two lungs, beta-2. So the receptors going to the bronchi, to the lungs, have beta-2 receptors on them. So if norepinephrine binds to the beta-2 receptors, what's going to happen to the bronchi in the lungs? They're going to dilate. Yep, that's it, right? So let's look, at, um, let's look at it this way. If we write out these, um, we have alpha-1, And beta 1, we have alpha 2, and we have beta 2, right? Alpha 2 and beta 2 are inhibitory. Alpha 1 and beta 1 are stimulatory. What do I mean by that? Alpha 1. Stimulates the pupil dilator muscles, stimulates the blood vessels that are in the, um, stimulates the smooth muscles surrounding the blood vessels. So they contract, right? Pupil dilator muscles contract and your pupils dilate. Peripheral blood vessels contract and you get um, vasoconstriction of peripheral blood vessels. Alpha 2 decreases norepinephrine release. Beta 2 relaxes the bronchi. So they're inhibitory. So now let's look at what happens with the alpha-2 um, receptors here. So here you have your preganglionic neuron, right, releases ACH. That stimulates the postganglionic neuron, right, and the postganglionic neuron, uh, it releases norepinephrine. So the alpha-2 receptor is right here on the postganglionic axon terminal. That's the alpha-2 receptor. And so norepinephrine is floating around out here in the synaptic cleft, and some of it's going to come back and bind to that alpha-2 receptor. Then through an indirect effect, the alpha-2 receptor will stop norepinephrine from being released. So that's why we say that alpha-2 is inhibitory because it decreases the amount of norepinephrine being released. Alpha-2 decreases norepinephrine release. Okay, so let's put this in context, right? 
So if, um, if alpha-2 decreases norepinephrine release, what if you had a, a, um, a drug like clonidine? So clonidine is what we call an alpha-2 agonist. And what does that mean? That means that alpha, this um, clonidine, is going to stimulate that alpha-2 receptor. So what happens if we stimulate that alpha-2 receptor? Are we going to have an increase or a decrease of norepinephrine being released? A decrease. It's going to greatly decrease norepinephrine from being released. What's that going to do then to wherever norepinephrine goes to? Where is that, what is that going to do to the blood pressure? It's going to decrease the blood pressure. What's it going to do to the heart rate? It's going to decrease the heart rate, right? So that's how that's that's an example of like an alpha two effect. It decreases the amount of norepinephrine being released, so that the effectors don't get the stimulation of norepinephrine. And there's a few things that the postganglionic neuron um, doesn't release norepinephrine. Instead, it's going to release acetylcholine or it's going to release nitric oxide. So I just want to talk about those. So spinal cord. Preganglionic neuron releasing ACH. Postganglionic neuron is releasing ACH as well. So this is these are some exceptions because in the sympathetic nervous system we almost always release um, norepinephrine from that postganglionic neuron. But there's um, ACH is going to be released here uh, at the from the postganglionic neuron. And it's going to bind to things like the sweat glands. Since we have ACH, we're going to have a different type of receptor. This is a cholinergic synapse, so we're going to have a cholinergic receptor. And that cholinergic receptor that acetylcholine binds to is a muscarinic receptor. Um, and we also talked about how when we also have, besides acetylcholine being released from that postsynaptic, postsynaptic neuron. We also have another one called um, nitric oxide that can get released from that postganglionic neuron. And so some will release nitric oxide, some will release ACH, and these are going to the blood vessels of skeletal muscles and the brain. So I just bring this up because at the same time your you know alpha 1 receptors are being activated and they're constricting the peripheral blood vessels. ACH and nitric oxide can be released from the postganglionic neurons going to the blood vessels of skeletal muscles and the brain, and those blood vessels will dilate them because ACH and nitric oxide cause, they, they inhibit the smooth muscles. Of the blood vessels.